I'm Pooja Isar. I'm the managing director at anitab.org India, and we champion for diversity. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you out there are already aware of Anita B, but I'd like to assume we are out there and pretty much people do know us, but for the purpose of uh, you know, members of the audience who are interacting with us for the first time, uh, just to give you a couple of lines about Anita B and the role we play. We advocate very strongly around the role of women in technology. And I can sum up everything about the advocacy, which is to do with a focused approach that addresses the biggest gap in the sector globally, not just India, and which is we need more women in innovation economy. Uh, wherever you guys are in your career journey, what we aim to bring to you is programs, platforms, and events on a year round basis to give you the opportunity to connect with and inspire one another, develop your professional skills, find mentors from global platform and gain recognition. Our communities, Pan India and globally, events and programs offer the resources that women need to build rewarding careers in technology. Our simple aim is to connect, inspire and guide women in computing and organizations as well that view technology innovation as a strategic imperative. We understand their needs because we've been in this for over 30 years and have worked inside organizations very closely that view technology innovation as an imperative. Our community extends around the world and we are driven by the belief that we can accomplish a lot more together than any of us can do alone. By being a part of the largest technology network, succeeding, achieving and thriving are some key elements that help you achieve your goal. We are 70,000 plus strong community across 90 countries with women, non-binaries and allies and this is exactly what a roster of any organization should look like and be reflective of the entirety of the society. Achieving this a representation is our passion. Uh, thus keeping diversity and inclusion at the core is where partnership with organizations like PhonePay adds great value to our mission. PhonePay's leadership in a very short period of six years have not only grown the organization by leaps and bounds, but are also looking at imbibing diversity and inclusion by exploring the roles of women in tech. I take this opportunity to thank PhonePay for this partnership to help further our cause. Um, PhonePay definitely needs no introduction. In some shape or form, I strongly believe each one of us today on this platform is connected to their products, platform, or technology, making our lives simpler. Uh, just talking about PhonePay just a little bit that we understand of them. PhonePay is India's leading digital payments platform with over 400 million registered users and counting and 32 million merchants across tier two, three and four and beyond. They cover about 99% pin codes in the country. Um, I don't know how to react to that, but that is absolutely phenomenal. One in four Indians are now on PhonePay. And we are talking about not just urban, but we are also to, talking rural and semi-rural demographics as well. The company's vision is to provide financial inclusion to a billion Indians by building a large scalable and open transaction ecosystem that creates the maximum positive impact for all the stakeholders. On that note, I believe it's time for the experts now to share with us their journey and technology behind the same. Thank you everyone. Uh, thank you, Pooja, for the introduction. Uh, it's really exciting to be Gayatri, here. Gayatri, over to you. We'll just give her a moment. I'm uh, sure Gayatri is just coming back. Guys, we're giving Gayatri 30 seconds. She is being unable to unmute. Just give us a second, please. Um, hey, everybody, good morning. Uh, are you able to hear me okay now? 
sorry about that i think it's uh, normal to have a glitch in such it's a large okay. gallery hey uh, i'm gayatri i'm gayatri kalyan raman um, i'm uh, one of the community directors that out of 70000 people i have a distinct honor today to introduce uh, rahul as well as the esteem set of speakers that we have today and your moderators uh, just a quick skin as a moderator if you have any questions please sort of put in the chat and uh, we will uh, quickly get into the q and a during the q and a session so uh, i just wanted to give a introduction of rahul i know rahul is uh, yeah, rahul chari is known to many or uh, most of you uh, rahul is the co-founder and cto of india's uh, um, the digital platform this is one in four of indians for use it and he also has a great mix of you know ensuring that not only do you have a technology experience uh, as well as you know getting the getting that intellectual expertise as well he has uh, more than two decades of experience of consumer internet and enterprise software he comes from flipkart he has been with flipkart from 2011 and he just, he had started the whole uh, consumer is experience we want to hear from rahul today on how do you continuously scale systems for such a hyper growth and continuously evolve processes right that's the day um, a while technology experience is great but how do you ensure that it is uh, processes are evolved technology processes are evolved and how change is being managed over to you rahul thank you guys for the introduction and thank you pooja uh, it's really exciting to be here uh, this is our first association with anita b and i believe it's an association that's going to continue for a while we are really excited to actually be part of just this not just this event but also a continuous dialogue with the much larger uh, community of women in technology as we've already uh, uh, spoken about it we have been continuously working on one making phone pay a much better workplace specifically phone pay's technology team for women as well as ensuring that we have the viewpoints of women in engineering and product so that we can continue to improve the product significantly so uh, i'd love to kick off this event with a uh, overview of the phone pay journey and uh, with the other speakers kanika is here with me she's going to talk uh more about scaling databases which is a very very important part of how we are able to deliver the kind of scale and performance that we see day in and day out uh so without much further conversation we'll start on the slides so so the phone pay's journey we already spoken about the fact that today one in four indians adult indians are a user on phone pay and uh, i'm hoping uh, many of you all are already using phone pay day in and day out but what have been some of the key milestones that we have achieved over the last 6 uh, uh, plus years uh, that we've been live as a product and 7 plus years as a company we started in late 2015 in fact it was december 2015 where we started with a uh, very simple mission of trying to actually make sure that we simplify payments without holding the consumer hostage to any one financial instrument that was a time when uh, you would have debit cards but transacting using debit cards was not very easy cash was significantly more prevalent and probably the most easiest way to transact and wallets forced you to actually store money into a new instrument and do kyc so there wasn't a singular solution that allowed you to use your financial instrument of choice in the simplest possible manner that was the simple idea with which we started phone pay we launched in 2016 as the first upi app in 2017 we hit the milestone and i remember the date i think it was november 2017 uh we hit the milestone of uh, 1 million transactions a day in in the phone pay app from there today we stand at 130 million transactions a day so 2017 november to almost november 2022 which is 5 years we've scaled more than 100x in terms of daily transactions this is not even visits uh something that we are extremely proud about and also humbled by the kind of confidence the user base has shown in us along the way we made some very very relevant choices uh we started day one from hosting all our services in our own data centers not on the public cloud for two reasons one first and foremost uh, we believe that performance and the ability the level of control that you can have right from the 
hardware, the infrastructure layer to the application layer is significantly important when you're building something like payments, the reliability and speed of transaction, and also being a regulated business and a regulated space to ensure that all our transactions are localized to the geographical boundaries of the country, we felt would be extremely important. And you might call it being clairvoyant, but it actually became a law going forward and served as well. Today, proud to say that we are in five data centers. Uh, we've crossed uh, more than 3 billion transactions on a monthly basis. And the total value of transactions on the phone pay platform is touching uh, annualized around 800 billion US dollars on an annualized basis in the current year. So this has been the kind of growth that we have seen. You see a lot of other milestones listed on the slide, but the underlying foundational piece that has got us here is basically simplicity of the product and the scalability of the platform. I mean, that if there were just two things that we would do day in and day out to ensure that we continue to actually serve the population scale that we have signed up for, population scale being a billion Indians, it would be to continue keeping the product extremely simple and ensure that the technology behind it is scalable, right? So when it comes to simplicity of product, the first thing that we talk about is how have we actually constructed our customer journey? What is the customer journey that we strive towards and how is simplicity embedded in that? So we've actually distilled our customer journey into four very specific steps. Uh, we call it the send money, the spend money, the manage money and grow money journey. If you look at it, it this simple <coughs> representation of our consumer strategy, if you may call it, and therefore our product strategy is to actually take the user through four steps of uh, usage of money leading up to financial inclusion and financial freedom. You start with being able to allow a user to send money freely to any other person. We started this with a very, very simple product innovation of being able to send your money, send the money to another person on their mobile phone number, right? Uh, it may seem like something that everybody does today and is considered matter of fact. When we did this in 2016, as and when we launched, it was very, very unique that you could actually select a phone number. That phone number would actually let you know that the person is also on phone pay and you're able to actually send them money directly to their bank account. That was P2P money transfers and domestic remittances, which had a unlocking domestic remittances by removing the middleman had a significant societal benefit that continues even today. From there, we'd graduate the user to spend money. Spend money, we classify into three different accesses. One is in-app payments. This could be your recharges, your bill payments, or any other services like Fastag, et cetera, that you can do within the PhonePay app. The second one is payments to merchants on your favorite uh, uh, mobile apps. These could be Swiggies, it could be Ola, it could be Flipkart, it could be Mintra. For all your online purchases, we continue to be a, a choice and hopefully the preference by the consumer to actually make the payment. And finally, on the offline space, each and every place that you see a QR, but not just that, where on the POS device at a coffee shop, you're able to actually uh, scan the QR on the POS device where it completes the transaction and prints the bill or provide your phone number where you receive a collect call and you're making the payment. All of that comprises of offline payments. Having users and become customers through send and spend, we are hoping to graduate them to manage and grow. Manage is all about trying to actually protect your uh, financial interest for the future through insurance, possibly extend your banking relationship beyond just checking your balance on the phone pay app to uh, opening FDs, RDs, and checking your statements in the future. And then from there, moving on to actually saying that, can we help you make your disposable income work for itself so that you start saving for a rainy day and then also your retirement? So that's the kind of uh, customer journey that we are uh, looking to build. We believe that we've only completed half our mission today, and that also continues to be something that poses its own challenges. Send and spend is what operates at scale, but that scale challenges on a daily basis. Like uh, the next speaker, Kanika, who's part of the core payments team, every month start, we see around 10 to 15% increase 
on the daily transactions and at peak probably a 20 to 25 percent increase in payments and that poses its own challenges and on top of the scale we are trying to build our financial services leading to financial inclusion which is the manage and grow but when i talk about simplicity how does this translate to simplified product strategy i think what has kept us uh, uh, i would say ahead of competition and be the app of choice by the consumer has been the fact that we've translated this consumer strategy and consumer journey into a simplified product. Our uh, UI and UX continues to be extremely utilitarian. When you're building for population level scale, you have choices to be made between being uh, cutting edge on design, significantly uh, uh, funky on the iconography, and possibly even on the interaction experiences being significantly more gamified, et cetera, which is very, very new age, or you can be extremely utilitarian so that muscle memory builds for you to use the app day in and day out in the fastest possible manner. And we've chosen the latter. The reason we've chosen the latter is because from day one, if we are building for all of India, India is not just India. Popularly now we call this term as building for Bharat versus building for India. We are an app that today is used uh, by users in tier two cities and beyond going into semi-urban, semi-rural and rural. That's how we've reached the 99% pin codes in the country. And when you're building for that, you have to be as simple as possible. So our information architecture on the app is compartmentalized to actually reflect our product journey. So the homepage is all about peer-to-peer -peer money transfers and the most simple interaction, which is recharge and bill pay. You have the stores interaction to be able to make easy payments on the offline space, which is nine out of possible 10 transactions on a daily basis. We've tried to combine large part of daily online use cases into what we call as the switch platform, which is an app and app interface. And finally, we allow you to actually get into investments, insurance through our uh, investments and insurance tab. So we've actually translated our product strategy into our UI UX and kept it extremely utilitarian so that we continue to be the simplest payments and money management app in the country. Now, when you do that, when you actually make an app that is utilitarian are actually forcing muscle memory to be built as the fastest possible manner and being ubiquitous when it comes to payment acceptance, you're going to automatically hit population scale. So simplicity leads to scalability. In fact, that's one of the values in the company. We say that simplicity you know, leading to scalability is how we should be thinking. So being simple first means that we automatically have high scale and high scale is what we build for as a technology org. So there are two slides that kind of try to capture how scale is interpreted at PhonePay. The slide that you're seeing is basically our impact and reach. So today we are available to 415 million Indians. 415 million Indians are registered users on the PhonePay app. Out of that, 185 million users on a monthly basis, that's our repeat monthly user base. We have 6.5 billion app opens. Now 6.5 billion app opens really translates to a significant amount of traffic on our edge. And I'll come to that in the slide that uh, captures our system scale. And like I was mentioning, we've crossed 3 billion monthly transactions. It has 3.6. In fact, the last number that I knew was 3.4. And that's the rate of growth that we are seeing. And uh, with this comes a significant amount of responsibility to continue delivering the kind of performance, the speed of payments, and the reliability of payments, which is where we take the whole engineering journey and the engineering approach at PhonePay extremely seriously. Right? So what does this translate to from a system scale? So today, our edge traffic peaks at around 800,000 requests per second. Uh, our successful payments is 215,000 payments per minute. Now that probably translates to somewhere between 3,000 to 3,500 uh, <clears throat> payments per second, but that's your average for the day. I think at peak, we would be closer to 6,000 to 6,500 payment transactions per second. Now, what I want, want everybody to take away is that we're talking about transactions, which means that effectively these are uh, ultimately commits to the database. 
that have to happen across a, a bunch of calls across microservices and have to be and have to be basically atomic. And we're talking about doing close to seven thousand such transactions per second at peak. Obviously, uh, the way we actually delivered on simplicity of product is to be able to use data extremely efficiently to one personalize where it makes sense to the user about the kind of services they need to actually uh, use do a lot of just in time nudges about newer services that they're probably interested in as well as repeat transactions like bill payments that they need to do all of this and all, and, and also interventions that ensure that uh, any fraudulent transactions are prevented early warning signals given to the consumer etc all of this comes on the back of an extremely efficient data strategy and therefore an extremely scalable data platform uh, we are extremely proud of the fact that we have under our storage in our own data warehouses in our uh, data centers more than three petabytes uh, of uh, uh, data and we capture close to 15 billion real-time events on a daily basis these real-time events are uh, basically used by various services so it's a pub sub model where you have every services publishing these events these events then being stored into a, a Kafka stream, and then you have consumers across various services. It could be the risk and fraud system, it could be the user system, it could be the payment system that are consuming these events for various reasons, or an offer engine to actually uh, look at whether this is a transaction that needs a offer or reward payout. Uh, blocking by risk and fraud systems for velocity checks to see whether the transactions that are happening are beyond acceptable limits for a particular uh, user in a particular location at a particular time of the day. So you see that these events that are generated on a daily basis are used real time by all other services to actually deliver real time impact. Uh, our data centers themselves have more than 100,000 cores under management today across the five data centers that we are live in. And we are uh, 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 today an ecosystem of more than 100 microservices. So how is it that we kind of deliver on this scale? So delivering on this scale requires a fair amount of uh, planning, as well as key design choices and principles that we've stuck to from day one. So the team at PhonePay, uh, the architects, the uh, team that has joined us from very early on, have actually stuck to certain things that have not changed over the last six years in terms of how we approach engineering at PhonePay. So the output that you saw is basically then really a, a result of the inputs that we treat as uh, uh, sacred at PhonePay when it comes to engineering. Our core DNA as a company is to be a technology decisioning org. The difference between a technology decisioning org and a technology driven org is that in a technology driven org, the entire company thinks about saying that how can technology deliver for a particular business goal in a technology decisioning org, whether to get into a particular business line, whether we would be successful in that business line, and is there an opportunity to kind of positively disrupt all comes from technology decisioning. We look at saying that can we build technology IP? that significantly disrupts the current market and it could be purely in terms of delivering on scale. Is there data intelligence that we can actually take to market with our go-to-market strategy for a particular category or business line that differentiates us from competition? Or can we actually use both the combination of technology IP as well as data to actually deliver significantly differentiated consumer experience? It's only on the back of such decisions that we even say that we will actually get into a new line of business. Uh, we have recently, for example, got into insurance distribution. It might seem that it's a category that is purely a distribution strategy and doesn't really have significant amount of differentiation. But we believe that one, the approach that we have taken to be a pull product and not a push product where we will never call consumers on phones, be a telemarketing organization to actually sell insurance, which is how it's done today, is on the back that we believe that we can build a product that will directly reach the consumer without any intermediary. And that product will have differentiation through data, where our risk models will ensure that there's price differentiation over time for all the products that we sell. So that's just one example of how we are a technology decisioning org, and we hold this 
very, very close to us. Similarly, we also think platforms and capability first, right? The engineering team comprising of people like Kanika, Shantanu, Fanish, Kaushik, some of these stalwarts at the PhonePay engineering org always look at every opportunity that could be a solution to deliver for the here and now with a lens of whether it can be built as a core capability that will deliver for the future. The example that uh, there are a couple of examples that I always cite and are very close to me. One is a system called Cyclops, uh, which is basically a in-memory uh, uh, graph that is built on HBase. Today has more than I would say a billion nodes in uh, uh, production. What we do is that when I spoke about sending money to any mobile number in the network, every user that is registered on phone pay basically becomes a, a node in the graph and every number in their contact book also becomes a node in the graph and we establish a relationship between these nodes based on who's in whose contact book. And then as the nodes then become users on phone pay, they are marked as phone pay users. Now this could be thought of as overkill to deliver the simple filter on whether a mobile number is on phone pay or not to be able to send them money. But it was designed to be much beyond that. It was designed to actually have a, a relationship graph that can be used in production in real time. And today is used for a wide variety of use cases, including being able to actually look at what is the recent transactions, possibly what are the fraud signals that can be derived based on the relationship between these various nodes, etc. And this was a day one build or a day one platform for simply delivering peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, mobile number to mobile number money transfer. Similarly, we have a system called Yatra, which is basically a journey tracking system. It basically tracks a user as they use a phone pay app for various use cases and allows you to actually build customized journeys that you should be targeting the user for through nudges, rewards, or promotions. Uh, we could have actually built this very simply, but the way we have built it out, we've actually made it the core platform that drives categories per uh, customer and transactions per customer at company level metrics. So the philosophy of trying to actually be platform first and capability first is something that actually sets us different from the, a lot of the competition that, uh, that is out there as a technology org. The third point, which is basically automating everything is again something that is culturally very important for us. Uh, in any business outside of cutting edge research, you could always blitz the market through a operational model and throwing more people at it. And uh, that is even much more real for a country like India, where we continue to actually see that labor is available in large numbers and is still cost effective. We try avoiding doing that because what happens when you're again building for population level scale is that you will never be able to maintain quality and consistency in anything that you do if you are workforce intensive. So we focus on being automation first to ensure that whatever we deliver to market from day one is scalable for the population, for the 400 million users that are there without any sort of embargo on how soon we can blitz the market. If we do it in any other way, we'll always hit a wall after which the product becomes suboptimal as an experience because it just doesn't scale. So uh, that's again something that is important to us. And the final point, which I've already spoken about, is for data to be the guiding star. I think here we are an organization that has truly democratized access to data. The 15 billion events per day that we capture is basically available to almost every engineer in the company to build their own dashboards, to have very high level of visibility into how production is tracking, not just from a system metrics, but also from a business metrics with the simple uh, thing that by doing that one, we encourage innovation within the company. Engineers across teams are able to look at metrics from business metrics, product metrics, and system metrics to suggest improvements or new product ideas. And uh, uh, more importantly, I think any sort of uh, deadlock in terms of uh, to engineers, to product managers, product manager and engineering needs to get resolved on the back of data. The one thing that scale delivers is the ability to experiment, the ability to capture data 
and for data to be the guiding star when it comes to any decision making of how to proceed when there is a, a disagreement. So I think these are principles that are not just engineering principles or principles for the company that basically make us a technology first company and a technology decisioning org. So even if we are all that, I think without having a tech culture, we'll never be able to actually stick to the plans that we've had to be a product first, simple product first and scalability focused company. So what, what is it about the technology culture at PhonePay that ensures that we are able to uh, uh, walk the talk when it comes to all that I spoke about so far? Uh, one, we are an extremely flat org with no glass ceiling when it comes to IC talent. I think uh, this is something that we have uh, again held from day one. We believe that uh, engineers should never be forced to actually change track to becoming a manager just because it's a glass ceiling either on uh, compensation or any sort of rewards. So we ensure that we are never ever an org that forces engineering into management. We are capability first. I already spoke about this. When it comes to prioritization, there's always a struggle about delivering for the here and now and delivering for the long term. As far as possible, we take a long view. We are not, we, we, it's not 100% there. We also are a business that needs to deliver for the here and now, but there's always a discussion about how something should be built the right way and the fast way. And we try to lean towards the right way more often than not, because when we built it the right way, what we get out is a platform that can actually be milked for 10x more value. That value could be enterprise value leading to revenue. It could be higher scale. It could be uh, uh, ability to launch new products faster. It doesn't matter. But 10x engineering for us has always been about being capability first. And therefore, in the prioritization, we always try to take a platform first view and build things the right way instead of the fast way. Uh, planning for us is never an org wide exercise. We try to stay away as much as possible from top down prioritization. And we actually treat engineering prioritization at the same level as business prioritization. Scale for us, delivering on scale, delivering on performance is always a P0 ahead of business. And uh, because it's so foundational, the company also adheres to it, right? Because I could be launching a completely new category. Tomorrow I could be getting into maybe lending. We could actually get into more financial services. But if core payments, which is the engine that is driving all the transactions, which is actually giving the data for us to create an edge on new products is suffering, it doesn't make any sense. So everybody gets that. And therefore, we are an engineering planning organization. Data transparency already spoke about the fact that every engineer in PhonePay is expected to act like a product manager. Their views on product and system are taken equally seriously. And the way we actually uh, enable that culture is to actually have high level of data transparency. Uh, and finally, keeping a engineering team as accountable for business outcomes, if not directly, but at least indirectly by having a very high level of visibility into the business when it comes to what are our revenue structures, what are our uh, profit structures, what is the burn in certain cases for certain categories. We try to keep very high level of visibility through the entire org because I believe that that's the only thing that makes engineers accountable. I think, I think one of the things that I uh, hold very dear is that coders are not engineers. Coders basically are, uh, I believe, more mercenary and deliver from a code perspective and move on to actually the next code that they think is exciting. Engineers take a problem statement. Look at the problem statement from the lens of what is the uh, value proposition that we are delivering? What is the business here? What is the go-to-market strategy? Therefore, what should be the right engineering or technology solution? And then come down to how we can actually build it out. And then once that goes live, iterate the whole cycle to see whether there are improvements and optimizations that can be made. So the job of the engineer is significantly more complicated and important than a pure coder and having high level of accountability for the entire cycle with high level of visibility is something that we've uh, uh, developed as a culture. And finally, I think if we are true to everything else that we have said, we need to stay as ahead of tech debt as possible. Uh, that's purely an engineering goal. 
And if prioritization isn't right, if it is top down, if we are not giving enough time for folks to be able to actually deliver the right long term solution, there will always be tech debt. But we are saying true to everything else, there shouldn't be tech debt. And I think as an organization, given everything that I've seen in the past for, for the other organizations that I worked with, one thing that I'm proud about is I believe in many areas we stay ahead of business requirements. And I think that's another thing that makes phone pay engineering differentiated from a lot of the crowd. Uh, with that, would love to pause and take any questions that folks may have. Uh, there are a bunch of exciting sessions coming up. The next one with Kanika. Uh, and then there are future sessions, I believe, that also will shed light on product and technology. Uh, once again, super excited to be part of it. And hopefully, I can be back talking about more such things, maybe on the risk and fraud side, how we build trust and also scale in very, very specific verticals that we are chasing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rahul. Uh, Gayatri, the floor is yours. Uh, there are some questions coming up and Gayatri, please feel free to uh, take over. Hi, just give us 30 seconds. Gayatri's again got a technical glitch. Um, just 30 seconds, she'll be on. Hello. Hi. I think I, am, I think there seems to be some uh, muting and unmuting problem, uh, given the number of people who are there in the call. I think uh, uh, I think one suggestion, uh, Riddhi and uh, Sweta, is if you can meet me as a co-host, I think this issue would no longer exist. Uh, Rahul, I think this is a very exciting uh, journey, which I have been uh, a witness as well in this. So one, um, you know, one thing that is reflecting on me is the engineering decision making rather than an engineering-driven organization. I um, wanted to just ask you one question that is coming in my head. Is, you know, what made you take that position in terms of saying engineering has to be ready before business can be done? It's sort of a stage zero before the, the next phase can start. What made you propel this sort of a principle? Because uh, it's transferable to a lot of people, right? So I want to understand that. Right. No, I think... Uh... In the past, uh, including at Flipkart, at uh, some instances, and even at uh, uh, Cisco, one of the learnings that I've had is everybody is trying to actually ensure that what they build is disruptive to the market that they're entering. Over the last uh, 10 years, and more so uh, post uh, the pandemic, it's become evident that any sort of disruption that you're looking at, irrespective of the business that you're in, has to be technology driven. And the third point being specifically to India, given that the scale that we operate at and for the market that is so diverse, right? I mean, uh, our definition of tier one, tier two, and tier three itself does not do justice to the kind of diversity that you would see within a tier one, within a tier two, and within a tier three in terms of uh, infrastructure, uh, accessibility to services, uh, etc. So when we talk about disruption in such a scenario, and it has to be delivered only through technology, it is very difficult to think of an organization that is not technology decision and comes from the engineering because nobody gets the complexity of what you're trying to build for more than the engineers. And I, I'll be the first to admit that as the CTO, I know much less than the uh, power of my team combined and uh, the core payments team knows about the challenges that they face and uh, the transactions that they are processing, the forward path, the reverse path, the chargebacks, etc. And trying to actually deliver that at scale is something that is the only way in which we can actually stay differentiated. So for me, the primary reason to try and build an org like this is to ensure that we don't learn the hard way that trying to actually enforce a strategy from teams that are not technology first or understand technology inside out would mean that we'll have a lot of hard learnings going forward. 
I would rather be the organization that actually is inside out from a technology perspective, delivers the solutions, is a little slower, but is more sure as we move forward, right? So I think that's been the main uh, reason that we are trying to build the org that we are. Excellent, Rahul. In fact, uh, as you were speaking, right, after I saw the 15 billion financial transactions, uh, financial events that, that you are able to generate on a daily basis. Um, I am also in the financial sector, right? Like there are many people in the technology sector. One of the questions that I had a follow on in terms of fraud, in terms of risk management, now, are you including this business event with the partners also? Or what has been that, you know, you in, in terms of, you know, managing the partners as uh, do you give those intelligence outside and what level do you manage that part? Because that is a core part of what PhonePay does, right? Yeah, it's uh, uh, so in fact, uh, the uh, real time uh, event capturing system that we have is, has been is, is open source. Uh, it's been built by engineers in PhonePay, but uh, it was started as a project that was not uh, within PhonePay and we adopted and we continue to actually contribute towards that. Uh, we don't externalize this today, but it captures events that are both uh, in app as well as uh, off app, as long as the interaction of the user, whether it's for a transaction, whether it is for a login, whether it's for a discovery is with the phone pay platform. So we have API based solutions that we uh, provide merchants as a payment gateway. Uh, we are a payment container, a lot of websites where you can pay directly without necessarily having the phone pay app. And obviously the phone pay app has a lot of services. All the events that get uh, created by user interactions with the various services, whether it's the user service on our end, it's the payment service, it's the growth or the offer service, get funneled into the uh, uh, Foxtrot system, uh, as we call it. Risk and fraud, for example, is again a real-time service that actually looks at every transaction that is happening and has a, a sub 10, 20 millisecond response in terms of the risk score for the transaction with a decision whether to proceed or to block the transaction. One of the inputs to that real-time system are these events. Now, they may actually get further uh, uh, computed upon by systems that are built by the risk and fraud teams. There are aggregation systems that we have that take these real-time events, aggregate them. There's a compute layer on top of that, which further actually makes it simpler for consumption of the results of these events. But risk and fraud is just one of the instances. Growth and offers is another instance. So it is a, it is horizontal infrastructure for a lot of applications to take real-time decisioning. It's also used for uh, alerting and monitoring uh, internally. Uh, but we haven't really externalized this. We haven't really made this something that is available for partners outside of phone pay interactions. But like I mentioned, it is an open source stack that we contribute to. Yeah, very, very nicely put, Rahul. I know in the interest of time, last one question, from a future perspective, right? I know it's a engineering has to be ready and uh, everything else will follow. Oh, I mean, how are you envisioning maybe uh, the next uh, two, three years uh, um, to where, where do you see uh, phone pay going in terms of the uh, spend or the growth or uh, where do you see? So I think uh, it's uh, it continues to actually be divided into two parts. Uh, we are in uh, uh, 400 plus million hands today in the country and there is still an opportunity for an other 300 million banked Indians who are not on phone pay, but or possibly not on any other payments app but actually bringing that 300 million onto the digital payments platform is not going to be as easy as the first 100, 200, or even the first 400. And it will be difficult. But there are a lot of uh, uh, learnings for us that we need to apply and new interventions as well as new value propositions that we need to create to actually reach the next 300 million. Uh, 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 some of them are on feature phones. The bet is that the feature phone uh, user population migrates to the smart phone fast enough. If that doesn't happen, we may have to actually enter the feature phone market. So there is going to be work cut out for us to actually bring in the next 300 million uh, uh, users onto uh, phone pay for payments. Scaling payments from the 130 million transactions today to 250 million. And I think the goal for the team is to actually with the philosophy of staying ahead, try to be at a 400 plus million transaction capability. So that's going to be another, again, work cut out on the payment side. Outside of payments, I think I'm extremely excited about financial services. Uh, there is the account aggregator framework, which will uh, 
make access to financial data for flow based lending flow based lending in a digital manner extremely easy so account aggregator is something that i believe will unlock digital lending significantly and therefore make digital lending something that is very very exciting both as a space that we can get into as well as an opportunity to cater to a large part of the market that today is left out from uh, legitimized lending and uh, insurance again given the level of penetration of insurance in the country i do believe that especially with uh, health insurance and life insurance post the pandemic it's become clear that it's going to be a strain on the economy if we are not able to actually leverage insurance for a large part of the population i believe that phone care will play an extremely important role in that excellent rahul one correction i think i have been told that uh, given the exciting conversation that we are having i think we have another 10 minutes that we can extend um one more question i have rahul uh, uh, is the what makes phone pay for a customer very unique i know from a uh, uh, engineering is uh, engineering cap uh, capability and everything is great i use phone pay on a daily basis because i find it very easy for to manage multiple of my accounts and everything but is an outside in perspective i'm sure you might have done a lot of uh, you know research that makes phone pay stand out what is that that makes um, um you know makes it uh, unique actually uh, it's a very interesting question there was a time when we were trying to uh, answer that to in a different way we wanted to say that what should we be doing to make sure that we stand out as being very unique compared to uh, competition every answer was leading to something that was fairly artificial and did not necessarily apply to the entire population i think today what sets us apart versus what makes us unique is the very organic realization by the entire user base that it when it comes to reliability of the transaction and speed of the transaction phone pay is actually probably the best that is out there and now that is something that we cannot market i mean it it would be artificial to market it takes long to actually bake in it comes through usage usage over time and usage across a large number of use cases so what i'm trying to say is we've taken the hard path ultimately of trying to actually focus on the basics the basics being that we are first and foremost a payments platform and doing that the most important responsibility is reliability of transactions and speed of transactions now in doing that the couple of choices that we have made that kind of sets us apart is to actually build technology again kanika's part of that team too which has actually built that uh, is to build predictive logic that actually sees whether a transaction being done by a user using a particular financial instrument or at a particular merchant is going to be successful or not right upi has its own success rate credit cards and debit cards have their own success rate the wallet obviously has the highest level of success rate but has limited usage so every transaction has a certain probability of succeeding or not when a transaction does not succeed depending upon the uh, type of transaction and the type of financial instrument there is a chance that the money reversal can take time or the transaction status completion can also take its own sweet time and that leaves the consumer and the merchant at a significant disadvantage what do they do right the the consumer might say that hey the money has been debited from my account and the merchant might say it's not reached my account you don't want that situation so what we have built is predictive logic that actually does not allow a transaction to take place if we believe that there is even a slight chance that it will enter into such a situation now that is a very very strong consumer and merchant first approach because ultimately as a platform where i am measured by the volume of transactions and the value of transactions i drive stopping any transaction deducts from that metric but we've taken a view to be consumer and merchant first that's just one of the things that actually contribute towards what i call as reliability similarly with speed so i think there are a lot of these things that add up to speed and reliability which organically has established us as the best in class in the consumer's mind i hear what you're saying the npci as a central regulatory body may actually be giving some of these hard beat and ensuring that uh, right uh, but uh, phone pay has added another layer of reliability to ensure that hey uh, not only do i need this i need additional so that uh, you know right uh, i mean you would realize that being from the banking side there is a credit like and a debit debit like and a credit like uh, npci is the orchestrator 
there are situations real time where even with the heartbeats running there could be queue build ups on the uh, uh, middleware on the bank side there could be some sort of back pressure from the cbs the cbs may not be available the ledger may not be there so the credit leg may have the debit leg may happen but the credit leg may take time it's a reconciliation process so based on history of uh, all the data that we have how we put data to use is to try and be predictive about the success rate so that we can actually choose to abort a transaction or not allow a transaction to happen if the possibility of it getting into one of the situations where there's a debit but no credit is possible yeah and uh, this also rahul it reflects to automating everything the automating everything is not just from a technology part of it right it also automating everything from a processes standpoint i think lovely i think i really loved it i just wanted to add one uh, aspect um, to what you mentioned about engineering driven versus engineering decision making and the next sentence you also mentioned about um, as products we don't push it we pull it in fact if you look at, i mean uh, and i was listening actually it look both of them are in sync where products are not being pushed to the customers the same thing actually uh, what capabilities that engineering can provide is not being pushed engineering decision making happens and you say okay here here are the things i think i thought it was lovely when you put it i know these two were independent statements that put together but culturally i felt it was reflective of an inside out approach that uh, phonepay was giving so uh, i just wanted to add one more question in terms of uh, can the credit card be cashed and uh, sent to a friend in phonepay i think that is a question that is coming from some of our uh, you know listeners is that so, a possibility yeah so we are a payments container so we are known as the upi app because uh, uh, a very large volume of the transactions that uh, we enable uh are for upi but we are a payments container where uh, users can actually transact using upi can transact using debit cards can transact using credit cards uh we used to allow the user to actually store their debit cards and credit cards so that they could actually transact with it by uh, uh, uh using the stored card itself and just uh, entering the second factor of authentication but with the recent changes uh, by the reserve bank of india we have moved to actually tokenize the cards versus store the cards themselves the difference being that we no longer have credit card numbers that are stored we have to have a new transaction with consent by the user to tokenize the card and the token for the card which is basically unique to phone pay as a platform and that user and can be used specifically only on phone pay it's a, a, a token that gets exposed is significantly lesser uh, susceptible to fraud than a credit card number that is exposed right the token really cannot be misused whereas a credit card number can be misused even with a second factor of authentication by social engineering frauds so we moved to tokenization based on the uh, rbi mandate we are proud to say that we have actually tokenized close to 80 to 85% of the stored cards with us uh, that are used actively and will continue on the journey to actually tokenize closer to 100% of actively used cards so love it tarahal just one additional question when we came to the upi part of it yeah. um, i think uh, why phone pay is revolutionizing how upi is being used with the bharat uh, tech stack um you know how was it that how are the what are the revolutions that are happening um that you see or wish to see in the whole sector of payments um, yeah i, I think I you spoke about uh, fraud i so spoke about risk i mean what are the other things that you were expecting regulatory or are those changes to come in i think i think uh, from a regulatory perspective uh, some of the changes that uh, uh, both policy as well as uh, regulation is trying to drive uh, that i think is very positive is basically disruption in the credit space i think uh, credit on upi which is something that has been announced uh, for upi credit cards i believe is definitely exciting over time see upi is a protocol right upi while upi is technically a network like visa and mastercard the advantage that upi has over something like a visa and mastercard it's also purely a protocol 
that can enable a lot of things. Today, uh, you could use UPI-based authentication if you wanted to build a KYC model on top of it. You could use it to actually be a e-sign that is uh, there and you could use it for payments, right? It's a protocol. Now, in that protocol, if you're able to actually fit in newer instruments uh, that are not just direct debit, but something like credit, I think it will open up credit and credit usage by the market significantly. Obviously, it will also mean that the risk and fraud signals as well as the credit underwriting signals have to also improve uh, to be able to cater to the scale of the market. But one has to be the driver of the other. So I'm very excited about possibly credit opening up on UPI. I also believe that as uh, form factors, uh, uh, mobile payments, while it is here to stay, you will start seeing newer form factors of payments that will uh, start coming in. And you will see a faster evolution of uh, small merchants from uh, uh, pure QRs to more intelligent POS devices and newer form factors of POS devices too. I think those are the things in the near term, I believe will be uh, significant changes on the payments front. Excellent. In terms of form factor and uh, what are the regulatory form factor also in terms of multiple options you have when you do a QR code, right? It's not just about, you know, yeah. one you're actually talking about. Um, I actually have one last question before uh, I hand it over back to Shweta is, uh, I mean, currently, I know you, uh, you spoke about the payments as a structure and you spoke about banking, insurance, and add on part of it. What, uh, if you can share, I, I'm, I, I'll be very honest with it. You can share the phone page revenue model. I think uh, some of the listeners are. Here. Yeah, I think I think uh, the revenue model of phone pay is uh, very simply put, there are uh, three revenue models. Uh, one is basically the uh, distribution of services on top of payments within the phone pay app, whether it is recharge, whether it is bill payment, whether it is fast tag, whether it's digital gold, etc. There is an opportunity for payments is so vast. And uh, the top of the funnel that payments provides to be able to build distribution services uh, that we actually earn a commission from is one aspect and you could actually keep going into other distribution services that fall under the uh, 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 quick checkout, uh, uh, easy buying decision and daily usage uh, model. So there's a distribution commission model that we actually have for various services that we deliver on top of being a payments platform. The second one is uh, uh, advertising and ad driven. We do have ads uh, within the phone pay app and the, the very fact that uh, these cannot be just uh, uh, brand ads, but could also be coupons and rewards, which can actually get significantly more better. I mean, we are not there yet, but get better in terms of affinity of what a consumer wants and therefore increase uh, conversion for the partners who are advertising with us is another opportunity on the revenue front. And the third one is financial services. I mean, uh, insurance, uh, lending and investments, all three of them from both a distribution and possibly in the future from a manufacturing perspective, which means that we become the insurer or we become the uh, lender or we become the uh, uh, AMC, et cetera. We are not today for any of them. We do only distribution, but financial services offers us an opportunity to be a pure distributor or choose to move from being a distributor to a manufacturer if that's what it takes to actually build revenue. So these are the three broad revenue models that we have. Excellent, Rahul. I think uh, this sort of gives me a inside view as to not only how phone pay as a user consumer works. Right now, I can I understand the cultural nuances of how we have to build it, strategy of how the technology has been. I think I'm looking forward to uh, next session on you know the uh, 60 terabyte of uh, you know transactions per second to how the whole thing has been transformed from a technology scaling perspective. Um, I would like to really thank you, Rahul, for not only sharing the challenges as well as the numbers, which is very simple and straightforward, right? but also being able to be vulnerable and say that these are the these are things that we have done and this is where we want to get to. I think uh, thank you so much for you know pledging to answer more questions uh, or more longer period of time. No, thank you so much. It was great. Uh, loved the questions and hopefully uh, the session gave some insight into how we think of PhonePay as a platform as well as as an engineering team. Thanks a lot.
Thank you, Rahul. So, uh, the, I think we are probably at an hour uh, mark uh, right now. So, just wanted to say that uh, after Kanika talks about the scaling of uh, from a technology scaling, we have now uh, we actually have the next set of speakers uh, who are going to come in and talk about product scaling. Right? Talking about not only uh, do we have to speak about how do we manage the uh, technology side, like what is the what is the under the hood? How are we managing prioritization? How, what are the cultural issues? Right? We are going to have the next set of speakers. So without uh, much further ado, um, Kanika uh, is there. I'll probably quickly introduce uh, you know, Kanika here. Um, Kanika, um, Kanika um, you did, um, you know, Rahul speaking about uh, the uh, uh, base uh, amazing journey um, to the uh, billions of uh, financial events that happen on a daily basis to one in four Indians use on a regular basis for pay with uh, 1,300 billers who are available. But what does it take for a technology to scale this sort of uh, change? Right? In the end of the day, we, uh, we are engineering tech change. The event is all about the change. Not only embracing the change, but also how do you manage the change? Kanika Ketavat has been the long-standing pillar uh, with the uh, phone pay since its inception. She calls herself a software development maven and uh, she also is a master in terms of how you manage, not just from a solutioning perspective, where software and, and the database uh, scaling perspective. And uh, she uh, talks about complexities and uh, scaling and optimization. Um, uh, and she's going to talk about that journey. And one question I just I'll be the moderator for her, but uh, I also want to introduce her that she's done her computing systems from Georgia Tech and the bachelor degree from NIT Alaska. Yes, uh, hi, Gayatri. Uh, thank you for the for the introduction. So I'll uh, start with the topic. I'll start with the PPT. So. Uh, as Rahul has mentioned, uh, over the uh, last uh, years, we have seen a tremendous growth in the uh, number of transactions we process at PhonePay. So uh, this growth has uh, posed like a lot of challenges in different uh, systems at PhonePay. Uh, today, I am basically going to focus on the uh, transactional system, uh, which is responsible for processing the payments uh, that are uh, that come to the uh, that come uh, through phone pay uh, e even in even in the transactional system we uh, had faced uh, different challenges in multiple parts uh, but today uh, we are going to talk about the uh, backbone of the transaction system which is our database and what challenges we faced how we scaled the database and how we have scaled the database to process even more transactions in future. Yeah, so I think, uh, so Rahul has uh, mentioned about the, the daily number of transactions that we process. Uh, so if you see the growth over years in 2022, right now we are processing more than 100 million, like close to 130 million transactions daily. Uh, in 20, uh, 2021, it was 50 million, and before that, it was even less. So it's like a 2x growth every year that we have seen. Uh, along with that, uh, we have also seen a growth or a spike in the peak number of transactions that we process. So it's not just the gradual growth, uh, but it is also the like at the peak time when maximum number of transactions come to phone pay. Uh, we have seen a similar growth in that uh, area also. So we process like around uh, 6K to 7K transactions per second uh, during the peak times. Uh, so now uh, these transactions, when they hit the uh, payment system or the transaction system, uh, they get, uh, so the database that is involved, it is that database is queried multiple times. So it's not like 6K transactions per second, is leading to 6K number of queries to DB. So uh, the reason for that is uh, in a particular transaction, there are multiple tables that are involved. So some tables are just uh, uh, are just used for reading some data. 
other tables are used for persisting this transaction in the database. So even like when a when a user clicks on a on the user clicks on the pay button, so uh, that time the transaction gets persisted in our database. And then when the transaction gets completed, again an update query has to be made on the database side. So it's like for if for 6K transaction per second, we see around 10X uh, number of queries on database, which is like 60K including writes and reads. So uh, before diving into uh, what scale issues or what challenges we, uh, we faced or we started uh, facing with the growth, uh, let us first understand the, uh, what database we use and why we use that. So the requirement from a transactional system is that it should be highly available. And even if there is uh, any issue or any, uh, any node is a uh, node gets uh, uh, like node is unavailable for some time, we should have some strategy to uh, e recover it uh, quickly or to switch the transactions to another uh, database. So that is the, uh, because the reason again for this is that since we process a lot of transactions uh, now, even a one minute or a few seconds uh, uh, non-availability will impact a, a huge number of user base. Uh, the second is since we are dealing with uh, the actual transactional data, which is financial data, we can't afford to lose any data as in not even a single write or update to the database can be missed because then it can lead to uh, unpredictable consequences. Uh, sim on the similar lines, the third one is data integrity. Yeah, so considering the um, previous requirements, we use MariaDB as a relational database. Uh, we use a Galera setup, which I'll explain at the next slide, uh, like what it is and why do we use it. The payment system application is written in Core Java with uh, like behind uh, like with Profizer framework. Uh, we use Hibernate as an ORM, object uh, relational uh, mapping, basically to translate the uh, Java objects to easily interact with uh, database. So, uh, like uh, as I mentioned, we use uh, Galera setup. So, the uh, the good part, like the unique part of Galera setup, is the sync replication. So whenever, like in this picture, like, I've, uh, like as you can see, there are three database nodes. A client connects to one database node, and let's see a write is uh, coming to the first node. So now, um, like Galera uh, ensures that this is synchronously written to another two nodes also. And then only the act is uh, given back to the client. So if there is, uh, if this ensures that the data is, we are replicating the data, and we are replicating the data in a synchronous fashion. So we are basically ensuring that even if uh, one node goes down, one database node is unavailable, our data is uh, present in another other database uh, databases also. Um, uh, there is another uh, node, which is a async uh, node, which is the fourth node. This, this is not behind the Galera uh, sync setup. So this is the async replication that we do. And this node is used for uh, backup purposes or running uh, reconciliation jobs and which are not basically required in real time. So uh, in the payment system, we have 16 such clusters, like 16 clusters with four nodes each. And each cluster handles one database shard. So uh, shard is basically a separate database, you can consider 16 shards as 16 separate databases. And uh, uh, like application decides on which database shard or on which database the query has to be routed. Kanika, I have a question. Uh, when industry, we normally use a term called sharding, right? Oh, in this context, right, how do you do sharding? I know sharding is basically you're talking about from a synchronization. Are we talking about a master master, uh, uh, you know, syncing? And is that the sharding that you're talking about? Can you throw some light on that? Uh, sure. So sharding is basically, uh, so let's say you have only one database with three uh, clusters, uh, sorry, with three nodes. 
So in that case, what happens is the application is interacting with just one cluster. Now let's say uh, your uh, number of queries increase. Uh, one handling those number, those many number of queries or uh, so many routing, so many queries to one database always becomes a bottleneck at some time. At some point, it will be very difficult to uh, even increase the number of resources on that particular uh, database. So that is where uh, sharding is useful. So let's say uh, you are you were uh, doing some 100, 100 queries to one database. Now, if you can divide this database to two, and you can ensure that 50 queries are handled by uh, the database one, the shard one, and 50 are handled by shard two. So in this case, uh, your uh, writes and read uh, QPS or the queries are basically getting divided across nodes. So that is one, uh, one reason why we use sharding. Uh, the, another, uh, the another reason could be that uh, with the uh, scale, with the num as you uh, see an increase in the number of transactions, uh, you can horizontally add more shards. So that capability uh, can be added, and it would be uh, like if you're if you're on that model, it will be easier to do a horizontal uh, scaling. Now uh, again, the thing is that somebody has to decide on which shard a, a query has to be routed to. So uh, let's say uh, like we have sixteen shards. Uh, so sixteen shards. If I'm writing a transaction to. Uh, application is the one which decides that on which shard the data has to be written to. And if the data is written to, let's say, shard two, it has to be queried also from the same shard. Like we can't just have random logic to route the data based on some, uh, like some uh, random routing, because we have to ensure a consistent way that once a data gets routed to one shard, it, all the subsequent queries has to also come to that shard. So that is why we use a DB sharding bundle, uh, which basically ensures that we are trying to distribute the data on, e on uh, equally on all the shards. Uh, it supports two to the power n number of uh, shards as of now, uh, with the intention that the data is evenly distributed. Uh, so the sharding logic is like a hash function. Uh, so with every database table, uh, you can define a sharding key. So a hash with the sharding key is taken and it is uh, like a modulus with some higher number is uh, taken to determine the physical shard. Another interesting thing that this uh, sharding bundle handles is, so as I said, if you're routing to one database only, let's say that database goes down. So in that case, uh, all your, the, end, the entire application will get impacted. Like you will face a full downtime. Uh, but in case of sharding, like if you have multiple shards, let's say only shard one is down, I still have other shards, other 15 shards running. So it is like a partial downtime for the application. Customers can still transact. Majority of the customers can still transact. Only few will get uh, impacted. So even this, like, uh, so our sharding bundle needs to ensure that no new transactions are coming to this uh, impacted shard. So that is also handled uh, in the sharding bundle. You can specify that this bundle is, uh, the shard is not available as of now and don't route the new queries to this uh, particular shard. So uh, Gayatri, did I answer your question? Yes, Manika, and you also explained it in a, with a nice uh, picture. Please go ahead and, and talk about your challenges. Okay, so, uh, Again, before going to the challenges, let's first understand what actually is database scaling. Uh, so database scaling is uh, managing your database, improving your database to handle the changing number of queries or the change in the query patterns. Uh, there are mostly two types or two ways in which we handle the scaling of database. Uh, one is horizontal scaling. Uh, where we, so as uh, like in the last slide I mentioned, like we have shards. So we had one shard bef uh, before, then uh, we can increase it to two shards. Later on, we can increase it to n number of shards. So it can be adding more shards, adding more clusters to your database. Uh, the second kind of scaling is the uh, vertical scaling. Uh, 
so vertical scaling is uh, basically um, vertical scaling means to increase the resources on a particular database uh, cluster or a node so you might want to increase the number of cores of this uh, of the database or the disk or uh, the disk capacity so that is uh, mostly the uh, vertical scaling so now uh, we'll deep dive into what challenges we faced in uh, in this transaction system and how did we finally scale it to scale it up to support hundreds of millions and even more transactions per day so uh, there were two types of challenges that we faced uh, one was in the data growth uh, and the other was the increase in number of queries to database so coming to first uh, since the number of transactions were tremendously growing uh, and they need to be persisted in database the storage requirements for those transactions will also grow with time and since it's a financial data we also need to store it for uh, at least 10 years uh, so that and it should be easily queryable and like let's say a customer dispute is coming after in within 10 years we are uh, we like it's a requirement that we should be able to process that so we can't just delete the transaction data we have to persist it somewhere to and it it should be easily accessible the second uh, challenge that we saw was in the increase in the number of transactions so even an increase in number of transactions there there were two uh, transaction patterns that we have seen one is the uh, steady state transactions per second which is basically uh, like let's say from uh, since like from morning the transactions will start on increasing it will increase gradually and it will come down gradually so that is a steady state uh, kind of pattern in this pattern also we have seen uh, a growth over the years but there is a second challenge second transaction pattern that we faced like uh, due to that also we faced a lot of challenges which was sudden transaction uh, spike so let's say you were running like a steady state you were on a steady state but suddenly you started seeing more transactions on the app which increased the number of database queries also very quickly uh, this happens mostly due to uh, online sales or during uh, the ipl matches or the other cricket matches so at that to handle this kind of scale was also uh, like this posed different kind of challenges and uh, that is why our solution uh, also take care of such kind of spikes so we'll address the first challenge we'll uh, uh, like see what challenges we face due to the first issue which is the increasing tps so um, the database scaling at phone pay we have uh, divided it in, like we have uh, done multiple iterations it's not like we did just the horizontal scaling or we just did vertical scaling we had to uh, revisit it multiple times had to um, like based on the challenges that we we were facing we had to take decisions and keep on revisiting our decisions so the first simplest or not the simplest but the quickest uh, optimization that we can target were the application improvements so those were the first things uh, we did after application improvements we also did some uh, improvements on the database side uh, now these improvements were basically quicker to do uh, gave uh, like we were able to easily measure the impact also and once we saw the impact from these kind of optimizations we went to vertical scaling which is the hardware changes or the hardware optimizations and then we actually went to uh, database expansion or the horizontal scaling yeah so coming to the uh, first uh, optim first set of optimizations that we did uh, were the application improvements so why uh, were these uh, necessary is because we started noticing that even if uh, even if our tps was uh, increasing a bit like if there was only a slight increase in tps the number of database queries used to grow exponentially 
So that is where we thought that uh, we should uh, see and revisit if we can reduce any number of database queries or if we can reduce the amount of data that we write to database. So to do that, uh, we first instrumented our code. Uh, we tried to figure out the redundant calls uh, that we make to DB. And uh, uh, like we did it using the instrumentation and distributed tracing, which gave us a view of the number of database queries that we are making. And we were able to see that uh, there are some queries which can be easily removed because they were just redundant. We, we, in some cases, we were fetching data multiple times. So those selects were, uh, can, could easily be removed. The another uh, uh, optimization that we did was, uh, so as I mentioned, we use Hibernate as an ORM. So Hibernate runs, a, so whenever you run an update to DB, Hibernate runs a select first. Uh, it uh, transfers the data to the application and then it run, runs the update operation. So for a single update, it is basically running two queries to database. So that is that was the another thing that we optimized by replacing Hibernate queries with native SQL queries, native SQL update queries. So this removed our one select statement uh, from some of the major, like major tables uh, in the transactional flow. It was only possible for do, to do for the tables where we didn't want to actually get the data, have some uh, checks on top of that. We were able to, uh, we, our use case was just to update on the database, just to update in the database without checking the state that we are in, uh, like uh, the data that the database currently holds. Um, Kanika, I have, a, I have a question on these two. Is one is, what kind of a monitoring tools were you using um, to manage the transaction? Follow on is, how do you test it? What was your testing cycle? How often were you testing in the lower environment before you moved to the environment? Because uh, concurrency is always hard in terms of, you know, validating whether this works as well as ensuring that, uh, you know, you monitor it and see whether this works or not. Uh, okay, so uh, to answer the first question, what monitoring we use? So even before starting all of this, like uh, to even realize that we are running slow or we are facing challenges, we integrated our application, our database, our hardware with uh, like if all these three components started ingesting metrics. So that it gives us a view that where are we actually, what bottlenecks uh, do we actually have? Like we can't just uh, go and uh, start doing optimizations without first realizing the bottlenecks in the system. So that was the first thing to even uh, like to, that was the first thing that we did. Uh, so yeah, we use like for application metrics, we were uh, ingesting the metrics to uh, like we use open TSDB as our metric system. So we were ingesting the latency metrics, we were ingesting uh, the thread pool connections, all these metrics to our uh, metric system. Uh, in case of DB, we were ingesting metrics like uh, the thread pools that are created on MySQL side, the number of queries that are coming based on like with proper segregation of writes, updates, selects. Uh, we were also ingesting if there are queries like metrics, like if there are any slow queries that we are running without indexes or uh, yeah. And if there are any logs that are uh, like if a DB is stuck on any logs that we take. From the hardware side, we were ingesting, we started ingesting metrics like CPU utilization, memory utilization, the daily growth that we see, the that is also on database side, sorry, and the disk utilization. So once we had these metrics in place, the first thing we saw was the uh, database queries. So like, as I said, why even a slight increase was increasing the increase in transaction was increasing the number of query queries by a lot. So that is why we did that first uh, optimization first. And it was, it was a quicker thing to do and the impact was also uh, seen, uh, like a, a significant impact was seen with that. Uh, to answer your second question, can you uh, please repeat the second question? Um, the second question that I was asking is, uh, 
when it comes to uh, this sort of a uh, uh, monitoring uh, how did you uh, you know manage the test cycles uh, particularly when you are doing a production data right you are changing the uh, native code to api you are also saying what are the stale commands and all of that what were your iteration length how quick how long were you testing before you were able to go into the uh, you know go into production okay uh, so the application improvements we had uh, like so application improvements we used to test in our stage environment because we are actually not changing any behavior we were just reducing the uh, queries that we redundant queries that we make to database so from hibernate to native we used to test it uh, run the queries in the debug mode and uh, used to figure out the duplicate queries like hibernate is running select before update that was figured out by running it in uh, in a debug mode and then after doing the change we used to run it again run the run our uh, application test cases again and do the stage testing so that was mainly for application improvements but for other improvements which i'll explain uh, in the next slides like database and uh, hardware improvements we never did the changes directly on the production environment so we always uh, tried to do thorough testing on so we first of all like we got like let's say i want to do some database uh, configuration changes so for doing that i have to test it out on the same setup as prod so uh, that is what we did we got a test clusters we got a similar test cluster with uh, three nodes and one node in async uh, we did so we first did the benchmark on that test cluster which has exactly the same configuration as production uh, we like we noted down the metrics we captured all the metrics with that and then we started doing we so there was couple of uh, database configurations that we changed like uh, thread pool uh, we also tried adaptive hash index and all of these things so with every we used to do, do the change in the database configuration and with every change we used to uh, test the data again like test the database again and capture the metrics now i guess the next uh, thing that you asked like how was the load uh, the same load was simulated uh, on this test cluster so uh, there is a tool called sysbench which mysql uh, provides in that you can specify the uh, so like from production we figured out the queries that we run uh, we replicated the same queries to sysbench so sysbench you can specify the QPS, you can specify for how much time you want to run it for. And also the queries, uh, as in the selects, updates, inserts, whatever we run, we can easily specify it there. And uh, so that is how we uh, simulated the production load. We had, so you can call it as a synthetic uh, load that we that we were that we were putting on our test clusters. So this gave us a very uh, good idea or a good replication of what was happening on production. Thank you, Kanika. I think that helps. Um, just to just a quick uh, reminder, I think we have about five, seven minutes to close out. Can we go into the hardware scaling that you mentioned about vertical and horizontal scaling, Kanika? Okay, I'll just cover uh, this database issues. So uh, database issues, we uh, the next thing that we did was optimizing some configurations on database side. Uh, the the uh, one thing that the major change that we did was in the thread pool uh, thread pool changes on MariaDB side. So we started noticing that uh, for every transaction spike, our DB used to go completely degraded. The reason for that was we were using we were creating a lot of threads on database side. Uh, and why was it that why was it created? Because there is a setting on the MariaDB side called thread groups. Uh, so thread groups determines the number of statements that can be executed uh, simultaneously. Now this value was previously set to one thread per client connection. Now if your number of transactions will increase and the load on the application will increase, it will try to make more connections with the database. Now more connections on uh, from the application side was leading to as many threads on DB. So it was increasing the DB load by a lot and that too very suddenly. 
which was uh, degrading our database completely. So again, we did some perf test to figure out an optimal value of this configuration. And uh, it was mainly like after the perf tests were done, we saw uh, improvements and the value was changed on production cluster. Uh, the third thing that we did was vertical scaling. Uh, like after, after all of uh, these improvements were done, we, we observed and we observed some improvements in the TPS that we can support. Uh, but there were still uh, many issues that we were facing, like our CPU utilization was spiking at, and it was going to 90%. We were seeing increase in disk utilization because of more transactions and more storage requirements. So to keep our, uh, like to continue to support these many transactions and to keep our database running, uh, we did some improvements, like we increased the RAM, we increased our disk uh, to double the capacity, we also changed to address the CPU utilization issue. Uh, we changed the processor, the Intel processor that we used to Ice Lake. So Ice Lake supports 64 cores. We were earlier on 40 cores, and now we had increased it to 64 cores. So post all these optimizations, uh, like post all these uh, changes, we saw some improvements. Uh, the application improvements of reducing the number of queries, it basically with all those changes, we reduced the queries by almost 25%. Uh, the thread pool changes that we did uh, helped us in supporting much more TPS, like 50% more TPS, uh, at like around 3K transactions per second uh, with a slight trade off on latencies. Because since we have reduced the number of threads on database, it will take some time for the uh, queries to get executed. So, uh, but the, the, good, the good part about this was that our DB was not going in a completely degraded state. It was still running, it was still able to handle the traffic. So we didn't have to face any uh, downtimes of the application. The third was hardware improvements where we saw a dip in CPU utilization, we uh, also saw 30% performance improvement. And now our database was able to handle around 4K transactions per second. Uh, so even after all of these optimizations, there were uh, like any uh, transaction spike post 4K, we still, were, we still started to, seeing, uh, to see some issues. Like our DB used to behave in a very unpredictable manner. Uh, when the transaction uh, used to spike more than uh, 4K. So now was the time to do, like since we have applied all major optimizations, we have done the scale, uh, vertical scaling. Now was the time that we moved to, uh, to think about horizontal scaling and to uh, like, we had already started thinking about it much uh, before this, but now we actually had to implement it to scale further. So with horizontal scaling, our, uh, the aim was to handle much more transaction growth, at least 4x transaction growth from where we were. Uh, so with horizontal scaling, we uh, expanded our database. So before we had 16 clusters with 16 shards. Uh, with the expansion, we moved to 32 clusters. Now by one cluster, I mean we have four nodes, again, just reiterating. Uh, 32 clusters was is handling 64 shards. So uh, like on each cluster, there are uh, two databases or two shards. Uh, now, like we are in this state currently with 32 clusters, 64 shards. But with this state, we can easily do the cluster split and move to 64 clusters and 64 shards with one cluster handling one uh, shard or one database. So uh, to achieve this, to actually do horizontal scaling, we uh, needed a way to uh, move the data from our uh, current cluster to the new 32 clusters. So to do that, uh, there were a couple of options. One was obviously that your application can do dual writes, like uh, on the 16 cluster setup, as well as on the 32 cluster setup. But uh, we didn't go with that because First of all, it will incre increase the latencies. And the second, it will lead to, like it will introduce one more failure point for a transaction. So we thought about keeping our application uh, transparent to all of this. Like application should not even 
know that uh, this replication or uh, sorry, uh, this replication of data or the movement of data is happening. So to achieve that, we uh, we uh, went with reading the bin logs, like MySQL publishes bin logs for every statement it executes. So uh, we had an application called Maxwell, which can read the bin logs of uh, published by MySQL. It publishes those bin logs in Kafka. So Kafka is a messaging or a streaming system. Uh, from Kafka, it was read by another application, uh, relocator application. And now this relocator application was responsible for distributing the data in the new cluster. Now this relocator application also had the logic of sharding, the sharding with the new, uh, so earlier our sharding was based on 16 shards. Now the data had to be resharded to 64 shards. So that logic was handled by relocator application. So, um, uh, Kanika, I think in the interest of time, can you go to the next slide and just share the outcomes? I think that would really probably help uh, everybody to understand the outcomes in terms of uh, these things. And maybe uh, we will uh, we'll also want to go to the fireside chat. <laughs> so you're all, yes, why like this such, this is a very exciting conversation. You also want to understand the outcomes. Uh, sure. So, uh... So the final outcome of resharding was that we will we were able to process 10k transactions per second, which is 2x of what we used to process. So uh, previously it was 4x, now it is 10k, 10K transactions. And the good part is that we process these with no latency issues. Earlier there were latency issues even in processing 4k. Now we are like uh, our DB is completely clean. We don't face any uh, latency issues till now. Uh, and also, as I said, that we can split those 32 clusters to 64 clusters. We can even double from here that we can process 20k transactions per second in future if we see the need to, uh, if we see uh, growth in the number of transactions. The another thing uh, that we have, uh, no, like we have implemented with this is like since we have moved from 16 to 32 and from 32 we can move to 64, the number of nodes have doubled. So the impact of one node going down will be reduced by almost half. So that is an increase in resilience that we have seen uh, with this activity. Uh, should I go over it? Or... I think uh, maybe I will probably give you a thank you message, Shikanika. Yes, uh, we, we have a fireside chat. And uh, uh, any last uh, words from you, Kanika, from the whole experience of scaling before we uh, go to the next one? Uh, so this uh, the scaling process and uh, identifying that we what challenges that we faced has obviously been very interesting. Uh, as a like uh, as a backend engineer, this activity also exposed us to a lot of. Uh, complexities in database systems or the hardware systems which we are usually not uh, which we are usually not aware of or we don't even uh, care about uh, the granularities of those things so yeah this is this was one of the most uh, interesting part about this like and we also because we did activities and phases we also got to realize that what each component can like which comp with changing what setting or changing what thing, uh, like doing vertical horizontal scaling, what each of this activity can impact uh, the database. So, and, and even a single configuration change can let the database support 50% transaction growth, which is like amazing. So yeah, these were the learnings and yes, the journey has been really interesting. Thank you uh, so much, Kanika. I uh, really, really appreciate it. And we're already getting the request that you should run a two hour sessions on this. <laughs> but we should, uh, we'll keep everybody posted on this. And uh, without much further ado, I wanted to, uh, you know, uh, please, uh, uh, my grateful uh, thank you to Kanika for sharing the journey. And I want to uh, bring Radhika and Malti to the podium on, uh, in, I, I'll give you a quick introduction while uh, we have. Uh, Malti and Radhika coming in. Uh, uh, Malti and uh, Malti come bring a huge uh, software product development uh, portfolio and she runs the portfolio with 
own pace. And she is excelling in so many different things. First is design thinking, being a faculty, mentoring uh, women in tech. And uh, she also has a huge uh, you know, following in terms of upskilling uh, up women um, professionals. And Radhika uh, has a, is a maestro of excellent systems in terms of product roles as well as in the technology side. And uh, currently she is working as a product manager at Amazon. And uh, the idea of uh, Malti and Radhika is going to be uh, to talk about scaling product skills and uh, uh, you know uh, getting the what is the, what, are, what does it mean by scaling product management and how do we how are we going about doing it right and uh, i know we speak about engineering tech change in the backdrop but we would like to hear from them as to what does it take to make it happen and um, this is a unique fireside chat i'm very excited to hear from both radhika and malti thank you so much gayatri and uh, we are very happy to be here uh, and uh, I was just uh, listening into Kanika, the fantastic uh, share out uh, that she was doing in terms of scaling. So that was a lot, lot about, uh, you know, from a technology per se. And, you know, as an organization or a product continues to grow, there is definitely a lot of element that comes from product, right? I mean, product and uh, tech are like kind of uh, party to this. So I think that is one of the focus areas that both Radhika and I are going to be focused on, that how does a product contributes as the organization and the products needs to grow and scale to cater to the customer needs, right? So in that context, I think probably we'll just start with a very quick icebreaker uh, where I'll probably do a little rapid fire round between Radhika and me, uh, and we will keep it really, uh, really fast and quick. Uh, so Radhika, uh, if I may, uh, could you just unmute yourself, Radhika? Yeah, thank you. All right. So probably I'll fire the first uh, question for you, Radhika, that you've been doing product management yeah. for a while now, right? And what is that one thing that you love about product management, um, you know, in, in your tenure? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gayatri, for the intro and uh, Malti. Uh, exciting to share stage with you virtually. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, one thing I love product management, if I really have to pinpoint, uh, I would say decision making. That is what really exhilarates me. That's the thing we do in and out every, like, you know, every day. The fact that every decision that we take uh, as, a product manager, as a product manager and the impact it could have on how, it, how the product is shaping because of each and every part of your decision. It can be a big decision from the thing of like what you want to build and why. From there to even the small copy or text that you put on the product, right? There's decision making along the way and the impact it has. It, that is what keeps me going. Uh, I truly feel like, you know, responsible and I get a sense of ownership, uh, the impact of the decision and that keeps me going. In fact, this is what I fantasized even before joining product management, which made me like, you know, move into product management. So for me, it is uh, decision making I, that I love it. Yeah. And, and, and Malti, now let me just uh, flip it around. I'll take you to the other extreme. Uh, given like the uh, wide experience you have, what do you think is the hardest part of product management? Well, I think a lot of things about product management is hard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and I think uh, given that it is hard and that keeps it challenging, I think one of them you already called out. Yeah. But uh, if I really have to say it would be, see, it's a very cross-functional role, right? So um, you kind of literally probably do not control a lot of those teams, but you still have to manage those teams. And when you have yeah. to manage those teams means you have to constantly meet with the teams whether you do virtually or you do in person, this thing. So I think the biggest challenge for me always has been managing my calendar, which is mm -hmm. basically always, you know, uh, from strategic thinking to, you know, the most tactical item to let's say the sprint planning and just being part of that scrum to the time when you have to manage your marketing team to your sales team, to your uh, design mm -hmm. team and even meeting your customers, right? So how do you find time to, build that relationship so that things keep going. You're able to relentlessly execute to deliver that product that you wanted. But at the same time, you're able to put some heads down to 
think strategically in terms of what is that should be that next wave of, you know, problems that you're looking to solve as part of your product. So I would say managing time in my calendar. Has always been the problem. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks for sharing that, Malti. Yeah. So maybe let's just kind of culminate this into a little bit of more uh, package thing, Radhika, right? That if we have to really say, uh, especially um, I'm assuming a lot of folks here are in, in tech and probably some of them in product. But if we have to really summarize that, what would be the top three traits for a great PM, right? How, how would you go along saying that? Yeah, so generally, like, you know, product manager, the number of hats a PM wears, it's hard to like pinpoint or box them into a specific skill set. It comes in like very different flavors, uh, very amorphous role. That being said, uh, what I've seen in most of the product managers of who I consider like, you know, really great, there are two to three traits that really stood out for me personally, all right? Uh, number one, I would say, is the product intuition or judgment. Uh, so they, that product manager, that product manager would have a good pulse on the customers. Uh, ideas could come from anywhere, but a product manager who is really a cut above can really, even without the data, even without the industry study, like they just have that judgment and intuition to figure out oh, this would work, this might not quite work because of these reasons. They ask the right set of questions. So that judgment and intuition, uh, I think is one of the first trait I've seen. Uh, number two, problem solver. I think uh, have to be an excellent problem solver. It can be a product problem. It can be any roadblock that gets thrown on the way uh, to actually launch it. How do you ensure you cut the weeds and make your way forward? structurally and analytically solving the problems in a methodical way. I think it's a very great skill uh, for a product manager. Uh, third, I would say uh, extremely good communication skills. At the end of the day, it all boils down to how you are communicating upwards, downwards, sideways. How are you managing your stakeholders? Uh, to, if you go and talk to your leaders, the way you mention your, describe your strategic vision should be crisp and at that level. And if you're talking to an engineer on your team, you should be able to dive deep and like, you know, explain in detail. So the kind of communication range is broad and to the audience, how you rally your team and all, I think that is very crucial. That is one of the important traits, I believe. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> and, and do you want to like, you know, share yours? Maybe you want to add what you think no, I think some of them that you talked and I would have them on my agenda also. Probably a couple of them more I would add. One is the communication part, right? I mean, as PMs, we are like communicating, whether it is verbal, written communication, press releases, whatever we are doing, right? There are There is always so much of communication that happens. So I would say a product manager needs to definitely ace the virtue of product, uh, you know, communication. I think the highest churn that I would see in my team would be writing user stories. How would you make that, you know, the user story that you have written kind of doesn't go through a churn. And the second, probably just to add in, I would say um, would be thriving in uncertainty, right? When, uh, you know, you, a lot of times we just probably have a vision. We have an idea that this is probably what we want to do. But translating that into specifics, that what does that mean from a, roadmap perspective? What does that mean from a feature perspective? So thriving in uncertainty, communication, and probably a little extrapolating on what you said uh, in terms of decision making, because not all the mm -hmm. time product managers really have, uh, you know, data on a platter. We really have to struggle hard to get that. And sometimes we just have to go with our intuition to say that maybe with this much of data that I have, I'm extrapolating, and this is the hypothesis with which I'm going to go and do this experiment or, you know, go ahead with the product launch. So I would say these would be some additional um, dimensions that I would say are really, really needed to be a great PM. Awesome, awesome. Uh, thank you, thank you for sharing your insights. That was like a quick uh, lightning slash rapid fire round. That was fun. Um, maybe Malte, what we could do in the next couple of minutes is maybe go a bit deeper 
in product management and also share our thoughts because the I think we've heard the excellent uh, uh, presentations earlier on the scaling part of it. And maybe we can also talk about scaling from the product perspective. So maybe let's start with this. Uh, you mentioned about product vision as the first thing, right? As a product owner, what are the important things uh, that you would consider when defining your product vision? See, typically in any organization, and, and this is an area which is completely owned by the product manager in accordance along with their stakeholders, right? So typically, if you look at how a product vision is evolved, evolves in an organization, is a top-down and a bottom-up strategy, right? Where you are kind of aligned with your business strategy, uh, but at the same time, you are you have your roots to the ground, you are talking to your customers, and you know it's kind of making sure that all that data is collected. So if I have to look at a compelling product vision, um, according to me, it has to be very, very customer-centric, right? That means the customer sees value in it, customer would be willing to buy it, and customer is willing to adopt it, right? So, so having a customer-centric product vision is extremely important. The second thing is that, what is the key value proposition? Why is this product or whatever you're looking to build is going to be different from, let's say, your competition or what the customers are used to? So what is that differentiation, right? Because that eventually would translate into your key value proposition. So I would say a product vision has to very well capture uh, what is the key differentiation. And for that, I'm assuming there are times when we have to do a little bit of stretch. It should not be like, oh my God, is it really achievable or not? It has to be achievable, right? But it might be a stretch, so, so that part is there. And the third, I would say for a product vision is that, see, we are not talking about, a product vision is something that you talk about like multiple years, minimum like a 12 months to at least a three month, three year horizon, right? So yeah, a yeah. product vision has to be futuristic. It has to be futuristic in terms of evolving consumer behavior. It has to be futuristic in context of how technology is evolving. It has to be mm -hmm. futuristic and still probably aligned in the um, you know direction um, how the organization is innovating. So I would say understanding the landscape, mm. understanding the landscape. Yeah, you know both both balancing the business and the technology aspects of it. So I would say these are some critical elements of a of a compelling product vision. That's how cool. I awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Now, if you want to like just contextualize that in the let's say we are building a product, a product can be at different stages, right? From like you are building something from scratch and zero to one product. But specifically, if you want to focus on the product life stage where you want to really scale the product. Hmm. from 10 to 100 you've got your base product you've got your customers but now you are now on the ramp of really taking it off like scaling as a product manager what aspects would you consider yeah that's a wonderful question and there are definitely a lot of startups and a lot of products which are kind of you know in that ch chas as we call oh, it yeah. in, the, in the product uh, language uh, lingo so i would say first of all the the product team should not kind of be unprepared for it so there is a you know there is a good amount of preparedness that goes in terms of what does my growth looks like what are the numbers like there were a lot of things that Kanika talked about right you know we a lot of you know optimizations infra related things that needs to be done but then I need to know that what is the number am I tracking am I looking at a 10x growth am I looking at a 20x growth over what kind of a timeline right there would be for example if somebody is doing a income tax submission right there will be a peak period that will probably happen spikes. in the last uh, the seasonal one week. spikes <laughs> the <laughs> regional spi seasonal spikes right on the last one week there will be like 5 lakh people probably trying to do versus the weeks before that you'll see the spikes coming in and going and maybe on certain days over the weekends you'll see, see the spike so what is the number that we are talking about right so having some numbers out there having a preparedness having a forecast is where i would start with the second mm -hmm. thing that I would start with, uh, I would look at is that in order to meet that, uh, what are the kind of metrics I have, right? Am I measuring in terms of latency? Am I measuring in terms of, uh, I'm, I'm talking probably a bit of about operational metrics, but also product metric. How does all this growth ladder up to my uh, growth in numbers? So 
probably more from a product perspective, I would say, what are the measures, measurements criteria that I have? The third is then that how do I scale up? Do I scale from an infra perspective? So looking at the technology uh, aspect of it, right? What are the opportunity area for me to automate? What are the opportunities mm. area? To, what are the kind of features uh, that will help, you know, keeping the product in the center and seeing that how can the product support in this growth? What kind of an automations? What kind of a feature? What kind of an optimization? What kind of an infrastructure that would help to grow at this scale? So being very, very innovative about it. And while you're trying to be very innovative, while you're trying to leverage on the new technology, not uh, dropping the hat on quality, I would say mm -hmm. is, is very important. And probably to summarize, I would say putting the necessary guardrails around your process, your uh, systems, your uh, uh, you know people would actually help you to kind of structure this so that you know it is it is not a growth for which we are not prepared of course there are always those p0s p1s and spikes that happen where we probably are not uh, but but as much as possible for us to do those uh, risk mitigations so i i would say these would be some of the things that i would look at when when we are kind of uh, growing uh, where we have uh, some good element of knowns, but also factor in certain elements of unknowns there. Yeah, definitely. I, and I think you're right. Like, you know, having a clear idea on like, you know, what are our goals? What is our growth curve looks like, right? Like how much do we expect and in what period? And because right. it's not, we have to start take much earlier if, not, if we're not like completely prepared. So having that uh, vision and accordingly prepare I think, yeah, makes complete sense. Yeah, that's right. And as I said, right, uh, Radhika, there is, um, and that probably also segues into my, you know, next question for you is that, that when we are kind of, a plan is a plan unless you like deliver it, whether it's a MVP plan or as a <laughs> plan, right? And there is always a fair amount and usually our wish list of product backlog is never ending, right? So yes. as a... Yes. <laughs> And the devil lies in the details, right? I mean, as you start to dig more deeper, you figure out, okay, this needs to be done, that needs to be done. So as a leader, how do you how do you go about, you know, making sure that there is a very great execution? There is a balance between technology and business or customer needs that we have to program. So how would you go about getting a great uh, execution uh, aspects? What would be some of the key factors that you would consider? Sure. Uh, yeah, let me take a stab at it. Uh, as you said, first is having a great vision, I think, but your job doesn't end there. When you're building a roadmap, I would always start with uh, my vision statement, right? Ultimately, my roadmap should align to my vision and my North Star. And as you rightly pointed out, having those metrics as well, having the statement of vision along with the metrics, what are your North Star metrics? that clarity on the metrics is super important. Your mm -hmm. customer base, your revenue, whatever it could be, having clarity on what are your North Star metrics is very important because your rest of your plan should all will always align or should always align to that particular thing. Are we making every year a jump towards that vision, right? Like, you know, are we going exponentially towards that vision is the key thing. So I would say prioritization first thing, Am I fulfilling, like whatever I'm doing this year, how much are they moving the needle on my top metrics? That would be one. Number two, uh, I think it's good to have some sort of prioritization tenets because on a day-to-day -day thing, you always have multiple things to prioritize it as a company, as a team, as a product. If we have defined tenets, Tenets can be anything, all right? I'll just throw some uh, examples. Do we want to, even at the expense of short-term gains, do we want to like, you know, focus on long-term growth, long-term customer value? And as a product or company, we should decide that because depending upon the stage of the company, some might just want to have like an immediate thing. Some companies or some products, the charter is, I'm here for the long haul. For me, long-term customer value is more important than the short term like this uh, gains, right? These are some of the tenets we should define and other thing could be uh, customer like trust, 
right? Like, you know, there are the decisions that we take ultimately should not erode customer trust for like uh, some business gains. So things like that, like how, how do we think about scaling automation versus like, go, like going, fast? where do we stand on speed matters? And at the same time, quality, do you take like a, a Apple model where you build like the, their tenant is different, right? Like uh, the way they kind of work on the product is different. The quality bar is different. And maybe for some companies, depending upon the stage of the company, speed matters, want to launch MVP and then nitrate. So what are your tenets from a company or product perspective? Those will be like guiding you in every decision that you take. So that would be my point number two. And these are, I'm not talking about the cost benefit analysis as a feature level, but overall, what are the high level things uh, that we should consider? Third and important part of it is it always depends upon the stage of the product you are in. I'll, I'll just take a minute to like, you know, if you're just building your product from scratch, the important priority for you to build is like a what is the min lovable product with a clear differentiation that you want to put it out there, right? At the beginning of the product, maybe the priority for you is not to build ML models, uh, right? To do recommendations and all of that, right? Because unless you have a scale as a, as a feature that might not make sense. So what is your min lovable product that you want to put there, get customer feedback and get it. At, so at that stage of the product for you, it is to get the product out, stable, good quality and clear differentiation. Now, as you put the product out there, the stage step two, it, your stage, if you're in the second stage of the product, the focus of priority could be, how do you acquire customers? It's not about at that point, like, you know, how do we, make the customers repeat and whatnot. We are still at the uh, entry door. We just want to do a huge uh, customer acquisition. What kind of distributions do you do? What kind of awareness do you do? Like how do you attract customers will be your second stage of the product. If your product is at that stage, the kind of initiatives I would prioritize is all about customer acquisition, customer growth, right? That is stage two. Now, let's say you are at stage three of your product where you've got your like critical mass. Uh, you've hit that like escape velocity. You're getting that critical mass coming in. It's good to sit back and think two things, right? Are you able to scale uh, before the next growth? You're now getting transaction where customers are coming in. There is awareness. But to really like, you know, now start the exponential ramp of are you prepared for it? Like these are the things when you have to do uh, optimizations that you talked about when you mentioned about scaling, right? Some problems will come into, will come to know only at scale. Uh, once you start having the scale, your whatever operational processes start to break down, things are just not scalable uh, once you hit a critical mass, right? I think then before you get to the second wave of growth, I think it's good to pause and think whether your systems, processes, whatever it is, are able to scale or not. Um, then I would end with like, you know, once you have that customer base, it's always good to have the depth of the customers. Are they repeating? Like, how are you going to engage and retain the customers? So your feature set that you want to do at that point would be different. So to summarize, I would say once you have the vision and tenets, depending upon the stage of the product you are in, your goals could be different and you need to optimize or like, you know, figure out how your roadmap looks like. This is what you're going to do at that particular stage of the product. It could be scaling, it could be like acquiring customer, it could be retention, but yeah, it depends upon the stage. Um, Radhika and Malti, I know it's an exciting conversation. In fact, you've given a you know quick view of how product management should work. Um, I know we are we are um, we are getting low on time. Uh, just a five minute quick check in. Yeah, yeah, sure. I think we are kind of almost towards the uh, you know end of the last uh, set of topics that we probably want to want. But if there are questions already, Gayatri, I mean we are kind of instead of you know probably we would be happy to take up if there are any specific questions that have come up. I don't uh, 
uh, I'm not seeing any questions here. I think I'll wait for Riddhi to come in. But uh, I just wanted to uh, one uh, one question from my side was the stages that you spoke about. Is there a uh, you know you know metric that you normally use and how, what, at every stage? I think that will be a something that you know that was running in my mind when you were speaking about. Oh yeah, I can take a first stab at Maldi. Feel free to add. Uh, so for me, uh, in the first stage, it would be about the customer adoption. I keep a very keen eye on my customers I'm acquiring, right? How many customers are coming to the product on a daily basis? What are the usage patterns? My key metrics will be customers, but I'll also, the other secondary metrics I will use and I will also see how they are using the product. It will give us a lot of insights on the usage patterns, right? And keep an eye on the feedback. What Because it is the first stage product, I will stay very close to the ground and try to get customer feedback as much as possible as to what they are liking, what they are not liking. So that would be my uh, first one. And in fact, during the, uh, the takeoff period, right? It will all be about customer acquisition, how many customers uh, we are acquiring as the top metric. I think... The output metrics can be other uh, business related ones, but from a product standpoint, customers is what I would uh, track. And then as we are scaling, uh, as Malti was also pointing out, uh, whatever growth in customer base we have, and then it also starts to come as the repeat rate of the customers. You want your customers to start repeating. It's not coming, they're coming just once in a few months and leaving. Like what is your monthly repeat rate? What are your monthly active customers? What are your weekly day of active customers? If you have a product in such a way that it's a daily usable product, what are your DAUs, right? That is where when the engagement uh, starts to kick in, when you get into the active side of customers uh, and ensuring the churn rate is more, uh, is less and you whatever you are acquiring, you are able to engage and keep the customers active. So the active part comes very close to it to measure the engagement and we need to ensure the churn rates are kept at minimum. This would be my high level uh, customer metrics. And on, on the other side, there will also be like business metrics, right? How much revenue impact the customers are, is pro, uh, they are providing, what is the lifetime value of that customer? All of that will come in the subsequent phases. Yeah, I think very, very well put, Radhika. I, I don't think there's much to add. Probably, I think just a little contextually, it will be a little different for a B2C product versus a B2B product because, of course, Absolutely. the life cycle is very, very different, right? So I think one of the things where, especially in a very, uh, you know, I would say SaaS products where we are looking for uh, customers to be able to be acquired and made aware uh, and educated about the product for themselves, I think some of the additional things that I would like to also measure, especially for a new product, uh, which is kind of getting is that, that how are my, um, you know, how fast is my customer able to find value in my product? So my time to value within the product is a, is a very important metric uh, because that goes in terms of my adoption uh, plus the, uh, the retention part of things as we, as we talk about. So I would say, Apart from a lot of other things to say that how much time does it take for me to onboard my customer in a SaaS product to the time to value would, uh, would one of the additional things that I would call out. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Excellent. Um, any, uh, anything else you want to add? Uh, final thoughts, uh, Radhika and Malti. I think this has been an excellent conversation, but I'm also uh, you know, keen to say that you know, it's uh, uh, close to lunch time for most of our... Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure. Like, yeah, uh, closing thoughts, I would say like, you know, if you're a product manager or aspiring to be a product manager, I think for a product manager, first thing, like Maldi also has hit it in the first thing of the hardest part, I would say managing your time well is very important as a product manager. Uh, so you have to optimize for the important uh, stuff, which like, you know, there are so many urgent things that come in your way, which might not be important, where your time might get sucked into. Take a pause and see if you can, like, you know, optimize your time for more important long-term things, right? Uh, so I think managing your time well is very important. Number two, I would say, uh, for, as a product uh, uh, manager, 
is basically like how do you how do you like uh two things here right customers where you are like at whatever stage of the product you are in don't lose sight on what your customers are saying like always keep glued to your customers that that thing is very important uh, in whatever stage of the product you are in it can be via data it can be directly talking to your customers voice of customers whatever it is don't let uh, go of that third is just have fun building products is super uh, interesting and when you look back uh, it will give you a lot of memories just have fun building the products yeah i would i would say two things one is that especially if somebody's uh, you know looking to get into a pm role i think the only way to learn is to do it um, no matter how much you attend sessions no matter how many books you read or how many sessions you do it is all about doing it so just get started whether it is a you know a site project whether it is that new feature that you think can add value and uh, for the second thing i would say is that uh, usually for a lot of scaling projects right there is always this confusion what is engineering led versus where is product led and there is a very sweet spot that product plays over there in terms of the the use cases the the key customer benefit metrics that would help while you are trying to scale it up so make sure that you know as a product manager especially when you are for a technology platform products i say this ex with experience because i have done payments platform myself is that we as product managers add a lot of customer plus business value over there so so go more deeper in there to understand that the variety of things that you're trying to do while scaling the platform what does it mean for the customer what does it mean for the business and at the end of the day the teams are working towards building the same product so it's like a joint yeah. vision it's a complete collaboration absolutely absolutely that's really important. <laughs> that's really important. yeah so let Thank you so much, Malti, Radhika, Kanika, and Rahul. I think it's been an amazing uh, learning experience.